Hey, you random stranger. I know it's been a while. I hope you've been doing all right. And welcome back to more chat about Fate Zero. Uh, today, we're actually also going to be finishing off season one. Last time, the Three Kings, Saber, Ryder, and Asha got together for the Grail dialogue, which was a very uh, a weighty, kind of contentious conversation that I'm keen to dig more into, especially now that I've had a bit of distance from it. Uh, and it sparked some very interesting viewpoints and some great comments came in, which we'll discuss in a bit. Uh, has my mind changed since I watched the last episode? Yes, a little. Um, last time I wasn't really fully convinced that Ryder had an airtight of a case against Saber as he came across as having, but since Thinking about it and reading some of your comments, I do understand more now where Ryder was coming from. I still don't think Saber deserves to be dressed down to the extent of having her very kingship kind of dismissed, but I do see more of the merits of Ryder's criticisms. Also, some of you elaborated on the excellent point that the aim of the dialogue wasn't really to interrogate which of the king's philosophies was the best. Instead, it was really to show that different ways of ruling emerge out of different time periods and different political contexts. So the real takeaway was seeing how each of the kings reflects on and I guess feels about and deals with the consequences of their rule. Episode 11 started with Ryder crashing the Ironsman's place, causing these alarm bells to ring in Saber's head because noticeably she changed from that slick black suit of hers into a full suit of armor by the time they'd met Ryder at the entrance. But Ryder was not there to fight. He wanted to try and determine who should get the grail by diplomatic means, basically, by having the servants talk it out amongst themselves and agree on who is the most worthy to have the grail. So I think you've got to hand it to the guy for his persistence in trying to rope the others into just yielding. Last time when they had fought Berserker, he'd asked in a much more ham-fisted way for them to pledge their allegiance to him. Obviously it didn't work. And with this approach, he's still kind of pushing that agenda, but in a more roundabout way. And I think it's really on brand for Iskandar. He is that confident in himself and in his ability and in his right to lead to the point where he can entertain the possibility, no matter how small, that the other servants just might agree to let him have the grail. And we see later on that this really bulletproof kind of self-confidence is the total opposite of Saber's view of herself as a ruler and it does become a source of tension between the two. I loved how the human masters were left entirely out of this exchange. You know, for all the ways that servants are subservient to their masters, they are summoned into existence by them, they're sustained by their manner, and they can be forced to act against their own will by way of the command seals. And yet servants can be every bit as free acting as their masters, and in some cases even more so. So it really depends on what dynamic exists between each pair. And we can see like a whole spectrum of types of partnerships. You have someone like Assassin on like the extreme end of subservience uh, to Kirei, or really it's Tokiyomi. Um, and they are essentially just meat bags to them. Lancer, um, he obeys Kaneth out of like a sense of his moral code. And despite Kaneth being this dishonorable asshole, that's really hard to deal with. Casta has become sort of like a weird uh, mentor figure or a kind of idol for Ryunosuke. And then of course you have the three kings, each of whom have their own different agendas to pursue regardless of what their master thinks. So I think that that makes this war far more interesting than if the servants were just um, obedient tools, as Kiritsugi would say, to just be used and ordered around. The independence of their wills and the personalities of the servants kind of multiply the number and the complexity of the motivations that are clashing and competing against each other for the grail, uh, which raises the interesting question, who has the better or the best 
most convincing claim to the grail. And because the grail doesn't really seem to choose based on um, any sort of criteria or motivation, for example, like the purest of heart or whatever, uh, it really comes down to who is left by the time all the killing is done. A conversation amongst kings, of course, requires a buttload of great wine, and Archer, who won't drink anything other than the best stuff, basically donates some from his personal storehouse. Uh, so Archer, Archer is an entertaining asshole, and I say that with all due respect. Um, what's interesting about him is that the the constitution of his very being makes it impossible for him to conceive of anyone else, including any other heroic spirit, as his equal. So he didn't even recognize Ryder's right to call this meeting to discuss who might get the grail, because in his mind he already owns it. And what underpins Gilgamesh's claim of absolute ownership over the grail is that his myth, as recorded in the Epic of Gilgamesh, is the oldest known legend to mankind. It's why his title is the King of Heroes, because his is the myth that every other myth takes some inspiration from, supposedly. And by extension, he owns every legendary item that appears in them. And by virtue of the Grail being a legendary treasure, it belongs to him, even though he knows absolutely nothing about it. Detlaf van der Eretien gave some pretty useful context for why Gilgamesh isn't really stretching the truth that much when he says everything belongs to him. They wrote, his treasury, the gates of Babylon, quite literally contains the prototype of every other servant's and possible servant's noble phantasms, as long as they are physical objects and not an intrinsic skill or ability. Basically, the culmination of humanity. The prototypes are how noble phantasms and accordingly how servants come into being. They make their way out of the treasury after Gil died and becomes part of their own myths or legends. Also, Gil doesn't believe he's a god emperor, he quite literally is. He witnessed the age of the gods, when gods and myths existed with humans, and its end. He himself is two-thirds god. Yeah, specifically he's like one-third human from a human father, and then two-thirds divine from a female deity. Which genetically makes no sense, but it's literature and it works somehow. So, uh, this comment though, uh, explains why even though Archer sounds arrogant, saying that anyone other than him who takes the grail is basically stealing from him. In this world though, where hierarchy is partly based on the relative power of, um, power of and precedence of the myths of the servants, there is some logical justification for his very like high and mighty stance. In fact, Archer is so disinterested in the grail that he very casually offers to lend a grail or two to Ryder, so long as he swears fealty to him. So for Gil, his concern isn't really about what the grail can do for him, but rather it's asserting his possessiveness or like his top dog position in this hierarchy of legends. And as a law grad, it was kind of interesting how Archer's claim over the grail is very similar to this legal concept in English common law called the crown's radical title. So radical title is this idea that the British crown can exercise its sovereignty and stake basically an eternal and absolute claim on any land so long as they were the first, the first to claim it. And it's the legal fiction that the Brits used to claim ownership over the entire landmass of Australia when they colonized it, even though it was already occupied by indigenous peoples. So to use the land, you either had to buy it or lease it from the crown. And in recent history, indigenous peoples have um, fought that and customary land claims have eaten away at radical title, but not without some massive struggles. So just like the Brits saw themselves as the first to arrive in Australia and thus made English law the law of the land and thus were able to claim radical title, Gilgamesh's claim to the Grail is based on some legal moral reasoning that his preeminent position in the history of myths means that he gets to lay down what the law is, including who owns the Grail for all time. Another interesting manifestation, I guess, of Archer's radical claim or radical title to the grail and every other treasure on earth was pointed out by Neron Kaiser. So they wrote, 
It's more difficult for me to discuss Gilgamesh's stand towards Arteria simply because while there might be a shade of understanding, he's mostly being disgustingly condescending and possessive. This is one of a few scenes where he's just being obnoxious and it's even worse in the novels. Uh, but in the light novel, there's also a moment when Gil, while still being very creepy, likens Arturia to Enkidu as a fool reaching for a dream beyond their grasp. Fleeting, yet so blinding. So the admiration is there, but mostly it's hidden beyond layers and layers of objectifying her as a treasure that's rightfully his. In this ep, when he encourages her to stay on her path, it's mostly because he'd like to witness her struggle and downfall for his own amusement. Yeah, I do remember last time making this connection between Enkidu, who turns out to be Gil's best friend and teaches him a lot about how to be a decent being uh, and saver. So um, I do, I agree that Gilgamesh's respect for Arturia is probably voyeuristic in nature and just another way that his narcissism expresses itself. So yes, on top of the creepy condescension earlier, he'd also taunted Saber for her belief in devoting herself to her nation and her people, which to him is absurd because a king is a god and should rule over their subjects without reference to their happiness or their needs. So to Gil, that Saber holds those kinds of ideals and ideas in her head makes her like this childish but entertaining sideshow and does ultimately reduce her down to just another shiny trinket that he can collect. I think I kind of latched onto Archer's seeming respect for Arturia, one because it offered her some sort of relief after enduring what I still think were quite unfair attacks on her competency as a ruler, but it did also tease uh, a potentially interesting twist to Gil's character. Like I did want to see a glimpse of some redeeming quality beneath all that scorn, something to counterbalance his total lack of idealism. But uh, yeah, my optimism there was just totally smashed by this comment. So thank you so much. <laughs> and look, as Niran Kaiser said, Archer's encouraging Arturia is far more likely to be rooted in a twisted fascination to see her fail spectacularly at trying to live out her lofty ideals. So both he and Ryder actually in different ways write off Saber as nothing more than a girl who is completely unsuited to her station, which is why I did share what Shabani wrote in. Uh, so I have mixed feelings every time I watch this episode. The banquet scene feels like it is meant to pick apart who Saber the King is and show that she is wanting or lacking in some way. The dialogue feels very one-sided on Iskander's part, and we'll talk more about this when we do get to Iskander. Um, and I think he's supposed to act as some kind of foil to Saber's ideals like Kiritsugu does. Um, it feels a little flat to me though because Saber hasn't been allowed to act as much of a hero between being wounded, rescued, and berated so far. Yes, that point so much. <laughs> Uh, she gives speeches and fights G, but every every step she takes is weighed down by judgment. I would speculate that this is because Fate Zero is a prequel, and there is an assumption you've seen her heroics elsewhere, but it feels a little lacking. Um, I also don't find it entirely convincing because Saber isn't given any room to rebut, but rather stands there like a little girl, aghast at being insulted rather than holding her own as king. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Like Part of why this whole dialogue didn't really sit well with me at the end was because it didn't give Saber her due for all the amazing things that she did achieve in her lifetime, plus the legendary status she did sustain long after her death. For example, to the point where historically, you know, later English kings, especially from the Norman conquest onwards, strived to emulate Arthur or used the Arthurian legend as political propaganda to rally people to their side. Let's talk Iskander. So Iskander describes himself as someone who just takes what he wants and that immediately pits him against Archer but it's all cool because the two of them very quickly reach this mutual understanding that they're just going to have to take each other out. So what's intriguing about Ryder is that he respects how Archer asserts his kingship and his ownership over the Grail because he doesn't exactly dispute Archer's claim to absolute ownership. Like what does any claim matter to him anyway if he's just going to go and take it for himself? 
True to his name as the King of Conquerors, Ryder believes his destiny is to finish what he started back in, I think it was like 4th, 5th century BC, which is to conquer the world. But he can't do that as a magically sustained spirit, and so he needs the Grail to reincarnate him as a physical man. So somewhat admirably, I would say, he is not going to ask the Grail to just hand him world domination. Instead, he wants um, the means with which to do that to make it happen himself um, as a mortal. And so I guess the, the key difference between Ryder and Saber is that Ryder wants another shot at his dream, whereas Saber is asking for a, for a completely different outcome altogether, like a, a dream rewrite of history. Specifically, she wants to reverse how parts of Celtic Britain were conquered by the Anglo-Saxons, who were like Germanic peoples from Northern Europe, which is the reason why a lot of us speak English today and not say Welsh. At first, and here is where my mind changed a little bit, I thought it was somewhat ironic that Ryder denounced Sabre for wanting to change the past because one could interpret the wish for reincarnation as a kind of expression of regret. It's like he regrets dying before he could conquer the world, which slightly undercuts his criticism of Sabre being unwilling to accept her mark on history. However, after reading some of your comments, um, which were great, I can also see that wanting another shot at his dream doesn't necessarily mean that Iskander regrets his first life. It's like through the grail, he's been given another opportunity um, not to erase the past, but to continue shaping the future. So, I mean, why wouldn't he take that? Saber's guilt over the fall of Britain and her desperation to change history gives Ryder the fodder to criticize her. And I think his criticism uh, has two main prongs. Uh, firstly, that Saber has the role of a ruler and the relationship that they have with those they rule very wrong. Um, so same as Gilgamesh, Ryder essentially believes that what a king does, no matter what that is, is right. It's like this funny circular logic that reflects actual historical attitudes that presupposed that the things the king does are right because the king did them. Like if you, for example, chose to be ruthless and Alexander the Great was absolutely ruthless, like he slaughtered tens of thousands of people um, when it was normal for kings and generals in that time to do that, um, then being ruthless was the right thing to do. Like there is just, well, there should be no room for second guessing your choices. Part of that is practical, I think. Uh, tyrants have always argued that in volatile situations, which in Iskander's time was probably all the time, you need that one person to be making all the big decisions and not second guessing them. Otherwise your nation will descend into chaos or be conquered. Part of it is also just blithe acceptance that a king's judgment is always the best judgment, no matter the consequences. It's again, it was an outlook that was perfectly normal back in the fifth century BC. And as Saber pointed out, after Alexander the Great died, everything disintegrated. You know, wars were fought over who would succeed him and rebellions erupted everywhere, which led to his empire being split into four different parts and a whole bunch of people dying. But to Iskander, as long as the consequences or even the mistakes that happened flowed from decisions he himself and his generals made, then he can live with that. So I, I did like the nuance that he's not really criticizing the outcome of Saber's rule, given that his own empire essentially disintegrated too, but rather that as a ruler, she should never apologize for or regret her decisions and the consequences of those decisions. I thought something that might have contributed to Saber's shock at Iskander's approach to kingship is that King Arthur, or at least the person who the legend was based on, wasn't really a king. They were more a commander of an elite group of fighters, and it was more a, a first among equals type situation. So the round table itself 
according to legend, was created by Arthur to send the message that those serving under him were equal and could speak freely and participate in decisions and advise him. Also, the king had to be worthy of leading. Uh, so yes, he made the ultimate decisions, but also he was obligated to consult with others and to rule fairly and justly. However, Arthur on several occasions ignored the warnings from people like uh, it was Merlin and Lancelot and Gawain on things like how to deal with his turncoat nephew slash son Mordred and various quests that turned out to be absolute disasters. So while the, uh, I guess the fraternity of the round table is nowhere near our modern conception of democracy, it still introduced um, an element of participatory decision making and potential failure on the king's part that neither Gil nor Iskander can really relate to. S enough that Saber is burdened by guilt for ignoring her advisors or being stubborn and supposedly making some pretty bad decisions that contributed to her own downfall. Although, again, I just feel like this has to be balanced with the fact that many things, including Mordred's betrayal and Lancelot's affair with Guinevere and plus also the small thing of like the massive Saxon evasion, um, not evasion, invasion, um, that those things were completely outside of her control and kind of need to balance that out with the potentially bad decisions that Saber made. A corollary of accepting a king's absolute power is that people should be devoted to their king and not the other way around. Uh, it's something that Gil and Iskander again agree on and Saber thinks is ridiculous. Although I think Iskander conceptualizes this quite differently to Gil. So unlike Gil who looks upon his subjects as more like ants or vermin <laughs> almost, he's just completely detached and aloof from them. Ryder, though he is unapologetic about being a tyrant, is all about camaraderie and fighting alongside his men and winning their loyalty. And we see that in the form that his noble fantasm takes, including the question he asks just before revealing it, which was, does a king stand alone? To which Saber answers, yes, of course they do. But for Ryder, if you've isolated yourself from those you rule, you have failed as a king and you don't deserve the title even, because a true king is one who's followers may fear you, but ultimately love and are in awe of and even want to be you. Writers, um, this Ionian hetero or a reality marble that projects a mental reality onto the real world reflects that to a T. So we're introduced to his endless armies, each one of them a servant who, despite being a heroic spirit, still pledge their loyalty to Ryder which is very cool, very OP. And a side note, I loved that they also included Bicephalus, Alexander's horse, who was legendary in its own right for how loyal it was to Alexander. And in fact, Alexander founded and dedicated an entire city to his horse after it died in battle. The root cause of this literally undying loyalty, at least according to, it, to Iskander himself, is that they have been inspired by his zest for life. Um, he embraced things like love and war and sex and greed to the very extreme, such that people could relate to him on a very human level to the point of being able to dream about one day becoming like him. So that's why Ryder has a gripe with Saber. He sees her as a king who lived by these unbendingly just and perfect selfless principles that no one could ever relate to or imitate or even want to imitate. And so here I want to bring in a comment from D. Wiseman who touched on this point. Uh, they wrote, every single one of them is right in their own way but also wrong in what they think. I think that was a pretty universal comment uh, in the comment section. Iskander versus the Sabre ideology is interesting. Sabre is not a king. Saber showed herself as a ruler to be an infallible divine presence that brought safety and happiness to the people, but it also brings a question of who could even compare. 
Uh, people during Saber's time will be happy and prosper, but that is also why her country got destroyed. She was never king or human enough. Iskander may have been a tyrant and a lot of his people may have suffered, but he was also someone who made people admire him and was human enough that he had positive and negative traits. Uh, anybody could have become the next ruler after him and anybody could have looked to him and thought, I can be like him or I can be better than him. Yeah, I found that last point particularly interesting. Um, but firstly, uh, I mean, the view that Saber isn't a king because she wasn't relatable or human enough still kind of strikes me as a strange criticism given that for much of history, kings have been accorded divine status and very much set apart from the common people like by design they're not meant to be relatable um so it was like a stretch to me for Ryder to condemn Arteria's kingship based on how people couldn't relate to her I mean I can see though after reading this comment how it would make sense like when Ryder said that the ideals Sable lived by may have saved her people once but did nothing for the people who were left behind to fend for themselves he may have been referring to how uh, her Britain fell apart after she died because her people lacked the desire to emulate her. And without that, there was no, I guess, shared national dream or ambitions to keep building on together and no successes, crucially, to follow in her footsteps to help keep that dream alive. Um, on the other hand, as we mentioned before, there's like a bunch of other shitty stuff happening too, including waves and waves of Saxons and other Germanic tribes invading Britain. So who knows if like a shared national fervor or ambition or, you know, spiritual successes to Arthur would have even made a difference to the fall of Britain. Like it's so it's really hard to deal in, in historical what ifs. The line I can make this world real because it still exists in within our hearts underscores that unity of vision that is kind of shared or shares with his soldiers. So if you contrast like the victorious team spirit cheering of Iskander's followers with that hard cut to Arturia all alone amongst the dead soldiers from both sides of what I think is the Battle of Camelon, um, where she was mortally wounded by Mordred. And this stark difference points to the second of Ryder's criticisms of Saber, which was that trying to reverse the destruction of a kingdom would be an insult to everyone who believed in and fought for that kingdom, which is the great point that Shiny Zenith made. Um, it's not about their philosophies as rulers, rather about how they look back on their rule. Saber isn't wrong because she thinks a king should serve their people, but because she regrets ever being king and wants to undo it. Rather than celebrating the noble sacrifices of the knights who followed her and willingly gave their life in service to her, she wants to, essentially, pretend it never happened, which does a huge disservice to the people who made those sacrifices. That's what Ryder was getting at when he said a king shouldn't have regrets, and why that criticism doesn't really apply to his own wish. Yeah, to me, this was, this was actually the more convincing argument than the you're not a king because you're not relatable enough criticism. So rewriting history carries with it the implication that you're condemning all the decisions and actions that led up to that history. And Saber was willing to do that because she took sole responsibility for saving her nation, which could be seen as sort of like condescending in its own way. Whereas Ryder wouldn't want to change the past because it would also mean erasing and disregarding how his own followers stepped up to own the building of their empire and all of its consequences for better or for worse. For Saber, it's all well and good to not lose sleep over the fact that your empire fell into chaos and destruction, but her regret also stems from a more um, humanitarian side, knowing that Many in her kingdom, particularly those who couldn't defend themselves, suffered, which I do think is admirable because it does show the well of compassion Saber has, even for those who normally would be considered expendable in like a very hierarchical, monarchical kingdom. Uh, I do feel that Saber overburdens herself with guilt. It's 
it's unrealistic to expect a king, even one with absolute power, to prevent any and all suffering that befalls the kingdom. But to rule perfectly and perfectly justly is exactly the standard that Saber holds herself to. So I did agree somewhat with Iskander when he disapproves of Saber enslaving herself to this impossible standard. Um, just not so much when he went on to link that to, like, the fall of Britain. A rare clapback from Saber was when she criticised Iskander for seeking the grail only to satisfy his own greed. Um, unfortunately, at least in this context, I, I don't think it was a very good clapback because it mischaracterised Ryder's wish. He's not being, I guess, oppressively greedy, or at least he's not consciously being that. Um, while tossing the needs of his people to the wind, to him, his larger-than-life greed shows his people how to be strong, I guess, and get what they want, so they too can aspire to be great, which benefits them and benefits the Empire, and everyone wins. So, you know, as to whether or not this actually reflects the reality of Iskander's rule when he was alive is another matter. I mean, a better counterpoint that Saber could have used to flip Ryder's criticism on himself is that the reason his empire collapsed was because, you know, three or four of his generals each wanted to be the next Alexander the Great. Maybe if he'd ruled more according to principles of, like, justice and fraternity and mercy and all that, all of the chaos and bloodshed that resulted when civil war and... I guess rebellions from very unhappy conquered populations erupted could have been prevented or maybe not like we'll never really know uh but interestingly on this same vein of thought there was also a comment from canada dry talking about the mutinies of his own men that alexander had to deal with you know suggesting that he wasn't as universally popular as his noble phantasm suggests. So one incident was making his men march through the Jadrosian Desert, which was a very poor decision on Alexander's part, solely because he wanted to seek glory for himself, which, quote, isn't any better, and it runs counterpoint to the whole is kind of speech in Fate Zero of the king relying on his subordinates and never being alone. The expedition just showed how arrogant and self-centered he was to think he could make such a journey and the cost was the lives of numerous soldiers who had been with him through thick and thin. It's also noteworthy that there are many conflicting accounts of the kind of ruler Iskander was. I mean, his title, Alexander the Great, was perpetuated by Eurocentric historians and accounts. But for a very long time, for example, the Persians whom Alexander had conquered they knew him as the accursed one or like the two-horned satan very um unpleasant names uh so to them he was the madman who'd forced greek culture onto them and destroyed like countless priceless cultural treasures most infamously burning persopolis to the ground with his men while they were all drunk so i related quite a bit to what raga shingo thought which was Yes, Ryder gets a big showy demonstration of the merits of his ideals. We see his armies cheer for him and kill for him. He enjoys it. They enjoy it. But we don't see any point of view other than his. We don't see a view from the armies he's crushing or the people he is conquering. Persians, cough. Ryder's view works great when you are the king in power to live life to the fullest. They work great if you are a fighter in the winning army, but they're not so great if you're anyone else. And they really fall apart if everyone follows Ryder's example and tries to conquer the world while living only for themselves. Yeah, amen. Nothing to add to that. Overall, I felt that while Iskander landed some good points, he's deliberately painted a picture of his own kingship that had all the shine and none of its flaws. And that's just his MO as depicted in Fate, right? He's like, Forge ahead, don't look back if you break things, because regret of any kind is unbecoming of a king. So I wholeheartedly agreed with what Thomas815 wrote, which was the importance of the end is probably less about whether or not Iskander is right and Saber is wrong, and more about the fact that Saber's got shaken to her core. Up until now, even though she always carries um, with herself a lot of guilt and a deep sense of regret, she always took a lot of pride in being a king and thought that the ideas that carried her actions were ultimately the right thing to do. 
Now Iskander's argument seems to have made her question the most important thing to her, her way of kingship. Yeah, so, I mean, you know what though, to me, the fact that Saber is even capable of questioning whether what she did or how she ruled was right after hearing a different perspective is like a major plus itself. Certainly when compared to how unassailable Gil and Iskander think themselves to be, even though there are many legitimate criticisms that could have been leveled against how they approach kingship. One final comment on this from Edda233, which was fascinating from a historical perspective. Uh, Alexander the Great has made the speech he gave to Saber before in history. In fact, he has made it twice, once to Darius III and once to a king named Porus in India. With both of these kings, we see the same pattern. He deals with them and speaks to them like an equal at first, and then after he has fought with them a little, he then wrote them letters denouncing them, telling them they were not really true kings and that they should join him and rule under him. Yeah, this was fascinating. So my take on Alexander's speech to Saber is that this is him following his historical MO. He sees a king he wants as a subject and basically negs them into surrendering their crowns and joining him. It is his nature to try and cast aspersions on the character of other rulers and try to establish himself over them. Thank you so much for sending this in. Um, I guess trying to break down Iskander's criticisms in this dialogue was a task and a half itself, but that additional perspective that it might have also been a habitual ploy of Iskander's to break kings down in order to secure their allegiance is quite compelling and really does fit with how Iskander tends to try other wily methods of pacifying his opponents other than through physical combat. Last couple of observations, uh, during the conversation between Tokiomi and Kirei when they're speculating on whether Archer or Ryder is stronger, they suspect that Ryder is hiding a kick-ass noble phantasm up his sleeve, and so Tokiomi orders Kirei to summon the assassins to launch a mass attack while they're drinking and making merry to try and get him to reveal it. Firstly, I think this is Tokiomi's utilitarian side on full display when he has absolutely no qualms whatsoever with sacrificing assassin just for the purpose of testing out Ryder's capabilities. Uh, he seems to share Kirei's, not Kirei, Kiritsugu's view of servants, that they are mere tools to accomplish their master's goals. And I suspect that is one reason why Gil really doesn't like him, even though Tokiomi makes a good show of respecting his legend status. Because at the end of the day, to Tokiomi, he's still a servant who has been summoned by him. Secondly, you kind of have to wonder how much longer Tokiomi can expect to be able to order Kide around <laughs> as if he's too is nothing more than a conduit for his own will. Like that resting bitch face that Kirei had, um, I mean, it may just be his natural face, but there's still this unshakable sense that he finds it super unpleasant whenever Tokiomi just treats him like a lackey. And so when Assassin and his many shadows do crash the party, interestingly, Archer has nothing but contempt for Tokiomi's decision to attack, you know, supposedly when the other servants have their guard down um, and you can sense that he's embarrassed almost to be associated with Tokiomi and his underhanded tactics so uh, ironically like despite his total lack of regard for other servants it seems that Archer still feels like he has a rep to protect as a servant who carries the very prestigious title of King of Heroes. And so Tokiomi's tactics really rub him the wrong way and it'll be interesting to see how that pans out as the war continues. And that's it for the recap. Uh, I know there's probably a bunch of juicy stuff we're just now getting to now that we are at the end of season one. So I am very excited to see where it goes from here. All right, F12 of Fate Zero, here we go. Let's time sync this in three, two, one, play.
what is that? His scepter? I mean, the symbolism of the moth was interesting. It's always used when someone's like trying to manipulate people or things or situations. I mean, Tokuyomi said thank you. <laughs> just don't know if it's enough to make up for all the times where he just treats Kide as, uh, you know, a foot soldier. There's definitely no love lost between those two. Again, I feel like the only pair that has a real bond with each other is these two. <laughs> Uh, right on a waiver. And I still maintain that it's just going to end in tears because of this great friendship that they've managed to coax out of a very just bloody war. Lisa's voice is great in this. Oh, and Ryunosuke and Castor, I guess they sort of have um, a great thing going on. Hey, it's been a while. Hmm, new hideout. I wonder what Kirisugu's favorite sandwich is. Maybe he doesn't care about food, he just wants to win this war. Yes. Strange ability and also uh, obsession is <laughs> with Saber. Nah, they're just having the time of their lives, I guess. Mm. It's like, he's a cool dude, but he'll also kill you if he has to. Still in this mysterious dance with Kirei. It's like Kirei and Kiritsugu, like match made in hell.
<laughs> it's my trash. Oh no. I'm gonna go after Saber, isn't he? There we go. <laughs> There's the voyeurism. Oh my gosh, this is so... <laughs> Why does Saber attract all the weirdos? Hmm. It is a total tragedy fetish. <laughs> it does make um Gilgamesh interesting, at least. Oh my gosh. Being a master. In theory. He's oddly intrigued by Kid A. <laughs> He's like, tell me more. <laughs> okay, but then doesn't that mean that Kid A is in danger of being killed? But then can he receive the command seals? <laughs> Just asking the same question. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought it would be because he was the one who lost Assassin and so he couldn't receive those command seals that were taken back. <laughs> Doubt. <laughs> Yeah, that is not his purpose at all. Oof. Is Kade really surprised? <laughs> That's his vassal. I feel like this is the beginnings of when they start scheming to stab Takayomi in the back so they can pair up, maybe. Hmm. <laughs> I just, 
I love any scene with Ari and uh, Saber in a car. Yes, she did. A bit too much enjoyment. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> this is such a cute conversation to be having in this context. Right. Oh, so this is like the same as riding a horse, I guess. Okay, I feel like we need to um, rewatch that conversation between uh, Kirei and Archer again. There's a lot of lore about command seals in there to think about. I mean, <laughs> not for long, probably. Yeah, whenever a character says, oh, this place is going to be safe, you know, it's not going to be. <sighs> Maya. I wonder, I mean, are her motivations, Maya's motivations, is it purely because she believes in Kiritsuka so much, slash is so in love with him, that this is her life's purpose, she's willing to sacrifice her life for him, not really quite sure. Yay, more Seibari moments. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting si excited over woven floors. Her joy is very infectious. That's why I really like Iris Feel. Just a rare, bright spot in a dark world. What's the shed for? That Saber is just loving this, like this very close, intimate partnership that she's not going to get from Kiritsugu. Hmm. Dying, isn't she? This is, oh no, this is probably another one of those things that Saber can't do anything about. She can't save her. It's gonna kill her.
Is it? Is it because we're drawing nearer to the end of the war? It's not a doctor thing. <laughs> I mean, is it an inherent flaw? Or is it by design that she was meant to do something that will inevitably kill her? This is just like a freight train rushing towards total heartbreak for Saber. Oh, God, no. Okay, so she can only ever treat the symptoms. And whatever's going on will just keep happening until she's dead on the ground. Okay. Okay, it's very straightforward. For Saber. Oh, and that as well. <laughs> Just that little hobby of his. Is this just another way of saying Karia has, like, daddy issues? <laughs> Uh, he stumped on Kiritsugu. That's not what Kiritsugu wants. That's so interesting that uh, Kiritsugu is the only one that he can't really read. Nineteen eighty eight. Ooh, that's a good one. Huh. Uh. Oh, that was an interesting test. Was it? Okay, I wasn't expecting that.
Is it because there's, um, I guess Kari is doing it for selfless reasons, for love, I guess, and love is something that is totally foreign to Kide. like you do you know that you have a greater purpose than just being a support boy for the tall suckers he's trying to i just trying to bait him into wanting to join the war again Oh, but because he was interested subconsciously. With Karia though, why Karia? <laughs> Ironically, he is finding a lot of enjoyment in peeling away Kirei's layers. No, not really joy, or I mean, sure. <laughs> But that's exactly what makes it interesting for them. <laughs> that's true. He's like, Ugh, I can't have passion. <laughs> <laughs> hmm okay he's just there is severe repression i feel inside kide <laughs> and he's finally hit upon his like you know sinful apple in the form of archer The command seals are coming back. Oh my god. Okay. That means his purpose has not yet been fulfilled. <laughs> oh, that can happen. Yeah, like who's going to be his servant? Wait, what? Wait, what? So you can receive command seals even though there's not a servant that's free? Hmm. Archer. It's just like hurting today. Deeper into the rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that that hadn't even crossed Kirei's mind before, like crossing um, Tokiyomi. I guess it is his dad, like the church guy. Wait, it's focusing on <laughs> Archer's like chess piece.
oh my gosh, he's literally, he's saying it without saying it. It's like, I want to be your servant. <laughs> he's such a smooth talker, Archer. Oh my goodness, those snake eyes. <laughs> That was so fascinating. The fact that it was a conversation, well, that episode mostly was taken up by this conversation between Kirei and Archer and them. On the one hand, Archer is, I feel like successfully has goaded Kirei into discovering that he actually does have passion inside him or an interest in the world or people around him enough to want well enough to have been given the command seal again by the grail in order to find out what it is that he's looking for so i feel like man that was such a momentous uh progression on kirei's part because now he realizes that in order to achieve his ultimate goal that he has just discovered he has to kill everyone else which actually includes Tokiyomi who is also working with his dad so that is gonna be ugh, that's gonna be rough and brutal but if his desire is as is so strong as to be given the command seal again even after just losing them then you know he's probably gonna carry it out Like, do whatever it takes. Ah, uh, this is so fascinating. Okay. I already have so many questions and thoughts running through my head, but we will finish off the season first and then uh, we'll have a quick chat. And I'm sure the comments for these couple of episodes will be really interesting. So let's uh, jump straight to episode 13 uh, in three, two, one, play. Just the contrast. <laughs> Aww. Just having a bro date. <laughs> Ugh, dark side to that comment. It's kind of like how they rampage through Persopolis, just having a grand old time, just burnt it to the ground because they were drunk. I'm going to have to look up the full story of Persopolis and how Alexander the Great raised it to the ground because... I have a feeling it was it was the result of someone daring someone else to do it and that's how it all snowballed from there. Yeah. Uh, I mean it is one thing to uh be greedy and satisfy your obsessions and interests and whatever which seems to be uh what Archer is pushing and what Ryder kind of advocates for as well, like this um, un not unhinged, what's the word, unlimited um, fulfilling of your desires, like there's you have the right to pursue what it is that you want to pursue and if it's in your power to do so, then there's no other criteria with which to judge whether you should do it or not. If you want to do it, you should just do it. Um, but yeah. It has consequences for the people who suffer because of those sorts of uh, decisions. So I don't know, it's kind of like 
the interrogations of different colors of morality is interesting, you could say, in this show. Speaking of which, we cut to Castor. They're like, why would anyone want to end our fun? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> the irony is so thick. <laughs> You're right, just a pair of true artists right here. <laughs> you know, yeah, destruction comes from creation, creation comes from destruction, blah blah blah. <laughs> it's the journey, not the destination. <sighs> This is such a messed up partnership, but it works so well. It's scary. Um, he does not punish them, he toys with them. Fascinating. Okay, that's an interesting read on how his case went down. He's actually insulted that God did not visit divine punishment on him for like murdering and defiling kids. It's the opening of the clouds to reveal the sun. It's another one just here for the pure entertainment, just for the ride. <laughs> okay. Oh, this is so twisted. I was just waiting for that punchline. It's like he creates all these kids for me to torture and revel in their pain. This is so good. It's Messing with my mind so much that Rianisuke is kind of restoring <laughs> Castor's faith in God through this twisted love of guts and pain and murder. Oh boy. Oh 
Oh god, what is this revelation? Okay, it's, so it's like... You can't know dark light until you know the depth of darkness. And so they're like, we are being or becoming the darkness in order to reveal God and his light in an even more stark contrast. I guess, sort of. <laughs> Okay, I guess if you think of God as some um, dude who is just interested in having fun and pulling strings and, you know, placing people uh, on a playing board, putting them in really interesting situations, then I guess you can justify Of what they're doing like murdering people because i guess murder is also fascinating in its own dark way <laughs> raver raver has just called them by their ship name <laughs> i love that waver's trying to put some uh moral boundaries on Alexander. No conquering, no taking what you want just because you want it. <laughs> Cue Grecian music. <laughs> I'm sure Iskander's read books on himself, right? Wait, is that a game? <laughs> I mean, why can't he just fulfill his dream of world domination through playing, like, Civ Six or something? <gasps> this is so cute. Mm, like a real mage would. <laughs> it's like, why are you obsessed with me? <laughs> oh, okay, all well that. <laughs> I didn't actually know that. That's interesting. Well, to be fair, even if you ask Iskander to his face questions about his rule, he probably wouldn't get a very um, objective view. <laughs> Hmm. 
Yeah. I'd rather have more life than be remembered for thousands of years. That's an interesting perspective. I mean... God. <laughs> Wait, why is it because he's he feels unequal in this partnership? I mean, he is a school kid. <laughs> He's got a lot of life ahead of him. <laughs> Oh, this is such, like, fatherly advice. Okay, Wave are just having a bit of uh, self-confidence, self-esteem issues. Uh. <laughs> okay, that was a great way to <laughs> put it, to reassure him that he's not the one who feels small in comparison to the world, of course. <laughs> Why? Oh, it's like a self awareness. Uh, reaching for dreams that are that seem beyond you. Man, right is so great.
<laughs> A pack of idiots. Oh no. Uh, it's after so many great philosophical conversations, and now we're launching into like physical action. Why would that? Is it because she knows how much that he wants to end Caster? Well, once he gives his loyalty, that's it. It's like... 100%. Wait, is that Saber driving? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, she has to now. What is he doing? Is that another book he has? Oh, no. His bloody vines again. <laughs> Yuck. Oh, what is that? that Kraken or something? What the? It's like a god-awful mutated version of a Kraken. <laughs> it's like, yo! <laughs> yes. Surely if they all combine forces, Caster does not stand a chance. Can they just stab the book again? A 
I mean... Yeah. Can't say that. Do something like PS3 to the middle? <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Huh, okay. Interesting. The Lady of the Lake, the one who gifted Saber with um, Excalibur. Was it Excalibur? Some other sword. <laughs> he always looks like he's having so much fun. <laughs> And of course, Wave has just been dragged along, same as usual. <laughs> Man, finally we get to see Saber fight properly. Still handicapped, but... Nice. <laughs> Yo, wait, is this the end of the first season? They ended it on that cliffhanger? Sorry. Wait, let me double check this. Yeah, that's the end of season one. Um, okay, that is such an abrupt uh, cliffhanger to end on, which is bizarre, but I guess... Um, hmm, let's see. What are some things that are standing out in my mind after these two episodes? Uh, you know what's so odd is my favorite pairing after Seibari is oddly Kirei and Gilgamesh, even though they didn't really make an appearance much in this uh, episode 13. But in the previous episode, it was so strange how watching the back and forth conversation between them has become one of the most interesting aspects of Fate Zero. It was so fun watching them um, go down this obsessive rabbit hole of trying to pick apart the motivations of all the other masters and servants, or masters in particular, uh, and it's almost like they they get so much kick or joy out of uh, playing that psychological guessing game. and. I was actually surprised that Kadia was the one whom Archer picked on that Kirei talked about the most and with the most passion uh, to show him that he does have this deep underlying desire to understand more about the people that he is fighting against. It was fascinating watching Archer just slowly reveal to Kirei that the tragic circumstances of Kadia's situation. So his heartless father, the way that Kadia has given over his body and his soul over to the worm magic in order to save Sakura, who for all intents and purposes has already been lost to the worms. Uh, it was fascinating seeing that unfold because it was like you could see Kade almost reviling or hating discovering that he actually enjoys thinking about or philosophizing about other people's pain because it goes against everything that the church has raised him to believe in and yet he is archer pushing this alternate view that there is just as much pleasure in other people's pain as in the so-called good things in life um, and in being this upright moral person that uh, is typical of churchgoers, you know. So the way that Archer was pushing these aphorisms into uh, Kirei's ear, uh, what was that thing? He's, it was like uh, pleasure leads to joy and then joy leads to happiness. Uh, very like biblical sounding aphorisms, but then it's sort of contextualized by this um, 
slow corruption of Kinei's mind. <laughs> well, I guess it's not really corruption because there was always that kernel of desire in him to pursue things that his mind had predetermined as evil. Uh, I guess he just needed someone, an enabler like Archer, to awaken that desire and show him that it's not wrong to enjoy a bit of voyeuristic pleasure in other people's suffering. And Archer, of course, gets something out of this too. Like, not only does he get to uh, play with or open the mind of someone who had professed to have no passions or interests, he gets a kick out of that, but also he's definitely trying to uh, shake Tokuyomi off his back. And he is suggesting, not, not explicitly, but very obviously, that he wants Kirei to take over as his master. So that is going to be an interesting betrayal to uh, see develop. There were also moments of bonding between Ryder and Waver and then Yanisuke and Caster uh, that it will be worth going back to and breaking down further, I think, if when I rewatch these episodes. Uh, so with Ryder and Waver, uh, the key heartwarming thing that we got out of their interactions with each other is that Ryder does not begrudge Waver for being an inexperienced or a lesser mage than all the other masters. Uh, Yes, Ryder wants to win the Grail so that he can be reincarnated. And yes, you know, he started out thinking that Waver's goal of proving himself uh, was too small of a dream. But now he recognizes in Waver this drive to achieve something that is completely beyond his current capabilities. And that is admirable or even honorable to Ryder because it fits his own uh, attitude towards conquering the world. And I loved that part where he pulled the map out of Waver's bag to show him and was like, do you see how small we both are in comparison to the world? And so it's not really about how big or small you are, it's that you give your all to make your dream a reality, even though it may mean that you're going to be chasing that dream forever and ever. You know, so I really love how Ryder was able to reassure Waver that this partnership um, in this war is not something that's a burden to him or, you know, that that Waver is not worthy of having Alexander as his servant. It's it's really about their shared attitude towards achieving something great, something beyond themselves. And so that was really sweet. In terms of Ryunosuke and Kasta, um, I feel I need to spend more time digesting the spiritual revelation that surprisingly Ryunosuke helped Kasta come to, which was that God is just a giant puppeteer who uh, shows his love by directing the lives of the billions of people on Earth and providing people like Ryunosuke and Kasta with the means with which to further his greatness by plumbing the depths of death and despair. Um, I feel like the most useful analogy is like, without darkness, there is no light. And so therefore, Ryunosuke and Kasta, by becoming the extremities of darkness through their killing and their um, gutting of kids and whatnot, they are doing God a favor by revealing how he's really just an entity that's there to be entertained by the extreme ups and downs of human life. Is that about right? I, To be honest, I really don't know. And uh, I think I just need to dwell on this pair a little bit more. Say Bari, <laughs> we got some more cute moments, which I am always happy to pick up. And unfortunately, there's always now when we see these two together, uh, their scenes are always tinged with this sadness now because we're getting a lot of in-your-face hints about Arisville's inevitable death, I'm going to assume, or sacrifice, even though we don't know exactly how that is going to pan out. Um, I had thought that because Irisville houses Avalon within her, that when she touched Saber, or was just around Saber, that the healing powers from that would be enough to uh, stave off whatever condition is overtaking her body. But clearly there is something that's breaking down. Um, and whatever she's doing, Irisville is, I guess, preparing herself for 
the end. Uh, so I do have a lot of questions around like who created Iris Phil and raised her to accept her role in the Grail War. What is her role in the Grail War? Um, other than to be extremely cute and just like adorable with Saber. So yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll see. So that brings us to the end of season one of Fate Zero. Finally, like I know this is taking so long, but it, yeah, it has been a crazy period. But I am looking forward to starting season two next time and seeing how the different pairs uh, grow in their relationships with each other, no matter how weird and twisted some of those are. I realized that we didn't really even touch on um, Solo Ui and Lancer, but uh, we will definitely do that next time. And I'm sure the comments are going to be great for these two episodes because there's just so many questions about command seals and what's happening with Arisville and uh, Castor, what the heck he's doing in the river and just all these ongoing parallel storylines that are converging um, that is making Fate Zero a very entertaining watch. Entertainment, right? That's what we're all here for, according to Archer. So yeah, uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and I will see you for the next reaction.